Māori Television has also established a second channel which covers New Zealand, which broadcasts only in the Māori language. So this, is, this has been part of the government's response to our cry for our language to live and to survive. You know, one of the interesting things about contributions to this, and again, I keep going back to His Excellency this morning, it has been quantified by economists that for every dollar the New Zealand government invests in these initiatives, the Māori people invest $3. And that $3 is not in cash, but that $3 is in voluntary time and voluntary labour to make these radio stations, to make Māori television and to make the Māori language strong. The government in 1999 created a Māori language strategy and it says that by 2028 the Māori language will be spoken widely by Māori. In particular, it will be common use within Māori homes, whānau or families and community. All New Zealanders will appreciate the value of the Māori language to New Zealand society. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the interesting things about that slide, which has just gone, is this. That a survey was done of the Māori language last year, and the interesting thing is that the uptake of the Māori language by mainstream New Zealanders, by white New Zealanders and Asian New Zealanders, is growing at a quicker rate than the uptake by Māori. So one can imagine that it won't be long that more white and Asian New Zealanders will end up speaking Māori than Māori themselves. And at that time, we will close down the Commission and end our job. <laughs> the Commission was established... Can you hop back one? Yeah. The Commission was established to give effect uh, to the Māori language to, as an official language. So there are three official languages in New Zealand, sign language, Māori and English language. They all have equal status. <clears throat> the other role of the Māori Commission, uh, Language Commission is to assist in influencing and implementing policy. We promote the language and we report directly to the Minister of Māori Affairs. So our role is a role of persuading, persuading the community, persuading the government, persuading government agencies to assist Māori to ensure that the Māori language lives. It's not one of, of compulsion, it's one of coercion. So now the Māori population has grown from the 80,000 that it was at the beginning of the 1900s to 530,000. It's showing a 1.7% birth rate uh, over the rest of the population. There are 130 people, 130,000 people, people who speak some Māori. There are some 68 tribes in New Zealand. 93 to 95% of the language is the same, but there are some 5 to 7% dialectual differences which reflect the environment in which they live. My colleague Martin, sitting over here, comes from the mountains, the tall mountains in New Zealand. I come from the warm climates, so I don't have words that describe snow. I don't have words that describe other things that only mountains have. Well, I have words that describe humidity, lovely sunshine, and other things that he doesn't have. <laughs> so there's a small dialectual difference. Marae, the, the buildings, the institutions, the traditional buildings and institutions which house this knowledge, there are nearly a thousand of them in, in the country. So the culture is strong. The culture is very strong. We have huge festivals. The Matatini Festival, where groups like this of 40 performers in each group 
some 50 or 60 groups go uh, to one place that's designated and they perform before crowds of 60,000 Māori people in Māori. Everything that goes on at those events is in Māori. Te Waka Toi and the Cultural Heritage Board, the New Zealand government has established Creative New Zealand, which gives large amounts of support to the Māori language through art and through culture. So it's not just the language itself. It's through culture, it's through art, it's through housing, it's through employment and other important issues. I want you to think of the blue sky. Jai spoke about it this morning. One of the key events that the uh, Language Commission has been doing is contemporizing the Māori language. This year we produced our first monolingual dictionary, Hepataka Kupu. It's one of the first monolingual dictionaries in the world. It differs from other dictionaries in that the methodology for the dic dictionary is Māori. It comes from a Māori worldview. It does not come from a Western worldview, and it's based around our connection with our gods. We also have translated into Māori Google, Vista, Microsoft Works, Microsoft Word and other programs so that our people can use them wherever they are in the world. In New Zealand you can call Vodafone, Vodafone tele telephone network because more people have telephones and type in a text in a Māori phrase and the phrase will come back to you straight away because more people have phones. These are our priority areas for the coming years. Intergenerational use of the Māori language, strengthening community support, national leadership, development of Māori language professions. One of the problems with success is we have workforce issues. We do not have enough fluent speakers to teach the language. So be careful of that as you grow. Probably one of the problems with growing too quickly. Go to the last slide again. Now I want to say that this journey hasn't been without its problems. I want to see our vision right at the end. Next one. This journey has not been without its problems. New Zealand doesn't know where the source of kryptonite is for this problem. It doesn't even know where the gun with the silver bullet is hiding. We want to thank the indigenous peoples of the world because the New Zealand model is based on bits and pieces from Wales, Ireland, the Sami, um, and other nations around the world who have made this journey before us. That is the beauty of being the younger brother. You come along and avail yourself of the experience of your older, older peers. We've been able to do that. The New Zealand strategy has been based on the things that other people have done throughout the world and done together. In conclusion, I want to leave you with this. We have a new world order occurring here in the United States. Recently, its first Afro-American president was elected. And the question, the statement I want to leave with you was given to me by my Canadian brother last night. And it is this, for those countries who are contemplating this process, how different would, could the world possibly have been if Martin Luther King turned up at the Lincoln Memorial all those years ago and delivered a speech that said, I have a problem instead of I have a dream. This is our dream. And we've lived it for the last 25 years, and the language is back from the brink and growing. <laughs>